Hi, and welcome to Tom Kennedy Science, and I'm your host, Dr. Tom Kennedy. Well, today, what we're going to talk about is the origins of sexual reproduction. You know, a theme in biology is that we often talk about meiosis and mitosis together, which I just did, but we often talk about meiosis and inheritance and diversity a little bit independently of each other. Well, the reality is in my next series of lectures, I want to talk about the origins of sexual reproduction, meiosis and inheritance, like Mendelian inheritance, because I think they often go hand in hand. But one thing that most textbooks often don't do is talk about the origins of sexual reproduction. And to me, that's kind of fascinating material. Eukaryotes are the only type of cells that can reproduce sexually. And in fact, they can reproduce both asexually and sexually. And of course, uh, we have two different types of cell division. We've got mitosis and we have meiosis. Mitosis is of course the asexual form of reproduction where you produce offspring, daughter cells, that are the exact same as the parents. Whereas in meiosis, you form four daughter cells that are genetically different and then those daughter cells form the gametes that go on to fuse to form a new organism. So that's sexual reproduction. And, you know, the origins of sexual reproduction have baffled scientists, for, I mean, ever since Darwin, right? I mean, even he was speculating on the origins of sexual reproduction. And it hasn't always been clear as to why there would be um, two sexes and why you'd have sexual reproduction. Now, as we go on, I want to make sure that we're on the same page with some of our terminology. So just really quickly, a gene, that's a heritable feature. So you have genes for something like blood type, okay? And that's, or hair type, or eye color, or skin color. Now, a lot of times, something like eye color or skin color might depend on a lot of different genes. So skin color might be three different types of genes, each one producing a different type of melanin. Eye color might involve something like 10, 12, 15 genes and then not all those genes are exactly the same you have what is called an allele an allele is a different version of a gene so if you look at Mendel's pea flowers you got a gene that codes for flower color and then you've got a variation of that gene called an allele and the variation would be are you purple or white that would be an allele and then a mutation this is any change to your DNA the sequence of DNA specifically, and it's mutations. They're the ultimate source of variation by creating new alleles. Now, so you and I, we had the same genes. I know, we had the same genes. But what we have is a different combination of those genes, and that's something we're gonna talk about when we get into the nuts and bolts of meiosis. And then we also have what is called the genotype. This is what genes you actually have, and then the phenotype is what you're expressing. So for example, the purple flower could have two different genotypes. It could have two copies for purple, or it could have one copy for purple and one copy for white, but its phenotype is purple. And on the white flower, its phenotype, of course, is white, and its genotype is two alleles for the white. And when we get into Mendelian inheritance, we'll understand what all that means more. So to make sure that we understand sexual reproduction, Sexual reproduction is when you combine two genomes to form an individual. So there are my parents, my mom and dad, back in 2009. They're visiting the University of New Mexico. This is when I defended my PhD. Gosh, has it been that long ago, 2009? At any rate, you may have heard that you have 46 chromosomes. What you really have are 23 pairs of chromosomes. You've got 23 from your mom and 23 from your dad. And in sexual reproduction, the sperm fertilizes the egg and forms a zygote. And then from that single cell, through mitosis, we grow into an adult. That to me is really cool. And it's through sexual reproduction that we inherit different combinations of alleles from our parents. That's why we look a little bit different from each of our parents. And if you have siblings, siblings, they don't always look exactly alike. Alleles for blonde hair, alleles for kind of reddish hair, right? But then they got alleles for blue eyes. 
So sometimes siblings look different from their parents because they have different combination of alleles. Now, I said earlier that, you know, sexual reproduction, the origins of it have baffled scientists for a really long time. And the reason why is there's a paradox of sexual reproduction. There's, there's two of them at least. One is you break apart winning combinations of alleles. So if you've got a really good set of alleles and you're a winner, why would you break that up? Hmm. And also, um, sometimes reproducing asexually is easier. You don't have to find a mate. When times are good, you just start reproducing clones of yourself. And if you're doing well, if you're well adapted to your environment, then it's likely your genetically identical offspring will also do well. Not only do you potentially break up winning combinations, but something that's reproducing asexually might be able to outreproduce you. But yet, almost all plants and animals and fungus, fungus are weird, reproduce sexually. So how did sexual evolution evolve? That's a pretty interesting question, right? So there are several different theories out there. I'm gonna cover three, and it could be some combination of all three of these. It might not be just one, but I'm gonna start off with my favorite. I'm just gonna go for it. The mitochondria did it. Yeah, mitochondria, right? You know, the, these powerhouses of the cell, we think of them as making ATP. Why would we implicate mitochondria in the origins of sexual reproduction? Well, let's find out. Okay, so we know that eukaryotic cells began with endosymbiosis. Basically, two prokaryotes began living together. And one of those was the mitochondria. And we all know that mitochondria make lots of ATP through cellular respiration. They're using oxygen. I love saying this, but oxygen is the second most electronegative element in the universe, next to fluorine. And uh, so here's our mitochondria, right? And they're living inside of our cells and they're using oxygen. And as our cells get larger and more active, they use more and more oxygen. And oxygen is electronegative. It likes electrons. So what happens is that during cellular respiration, there's a cost. Oxygen forms ROSs, reactive oxygen species. Now, don't ever confuse that with an R-O-U-S. You know what I'm talking about. A rodent of unusual size from the fire swamps of the Princess Bride. They exist, right? Inconceivable. But at any rate, let's get back to these R-O-S's. Reactive oxygen species can damage your cells by oxidizing them. It, it kind of breaks them down. It damages them. So by producing these reactive oxygen species, you can damage your membranes, you can damage your proteins, you can damage your DNA. So if you damage a crucial gene in your DNA and your cell dies, you take the mitochondria down with you. So if you remember in sexual reproduction, you're combining two genomes into one organism. That means you've got two copies of your genes. So if one becomes damaged, you have a backup. And not only do you have a backup copy, you've got one that you can affect in a repair on the damaged copy. So that's why we think that mitochondria may have been important in the evolution of sexual reproduction. But there's a more. You know, this may have come along afterwards, but one thing that we know is that sexual reproduction increases genetic variation in a population. Now, to be clear, mutations create new alleles. That is your ultimate source of variation in a population. Okay, remember, a gene is a heritable feature, an allele is a different version of a gene. So you have A blood, you have B blood, you have O blood. Those would be different alleles for the gene for blood type, okay? And that's only made by mutation. But what sexual reproduction does is take alleles like a deck of cards and shuffles them into new combinations, okay? And then some combinations are winners and some combinations are losers. Does that make sense? So whenever you're playing a card game, 
you're not making new cards, but what you are doing is shuffling those cards into unique combinations. And those unique combinations could be winning and losing. And that is the importance of sexual reproduction and the fact they can create winning combinations, especially if your environment is constantly changing, you can create a lot of genetic variation very quickly by having different combinations of alleles. Mutations have created a few different uh, variations in our alleles. Through sexual reproduction, we have a lot of genetic variation in the human population, way more variation than you might have from mutations alone. And of course, it creates awesomeness, like Cliff Burton, one of the greatest bass players of all time, Lars Ulrich, great songwriter, great drummer, James Hetfield, you know, one of the best thrash metal vocalists and lead guitarists of all time, and Kirk Hammett, one of the greatest guitarists of all time. And of course, they formed Metallica. I know, I know. You guys are going, oh, Metallica, they're not that great. They haven't been great in years. Well, in the 1980s, when I was introduced to Metallica, I had never heard anything like that and thought that they were one of the greatest bands I've ever heard. And even today, I still really enjoy listening to their music. It was amazing. And uh, Whiskey in the Jar, even though it's an old Irish folk song, their version of it is one of my favorite songs of all time, along with One for Whom the Bell Tolls. Yeah, you get the idea. Okay, let's get back to it here. The other one, the third theory I'm going to talk about, and this one's controversial, is that it removes what we call a deleterious alleles from the population. And deleterious alleles, these are alleles that might be bad, damaged, don't function, and cause some type of problem to the organism. So if you think about it this way, sexual reproduction is not creating new alleles, it's creating different combinations of alleles, like shuffling the deck of cards. So if you're playing Hold'em and you're sitting on a 2-7 off-suited split, no when to fold them. Hey man, but if you get an ace, king, queen, jack, and a 10 all suited, you're going to win, right? And that would be a winner. And the idea here is that the losers are likely to be gone, like Beavis and Butthead. But then something like Einstein would be a winner. And the idea is that if you have a losing hand, like Beavis and Butthead here, these guys probably have very low fitness. I'm not talking about physical activity, I'm talking about the ability to pass your genes on to the next generation. The idea here is if you get an individual with a few deleterious alleles and that individual does not reproduce, those alleles in that individual are now gone from the population. It is that if you take deleterious alleles, stick them into an individual, and that individual no longer reproduces, then you can increase the fitness of your entire population. And uh, that is highly controversial because it's population level evolution. Now, of course, populations are the smallest unit that can evolve, but usually we say natural selection acts on the individual. But in this case, you know, it's acting at a higher level because you're improving the fitness of your population by removing deleterious alleles. Interesting theory, I kind of like it. Sorry, Beavis and Butthead. Yeah, I remember being in college and we would stop studying to watch the new episodes. Did I just date myself? Now I listen to this song about letting it go. So from there, whatever the reason was, eventually um, we started getting sexual reproduction and we had to come up with a new way of dividing the cells to create haploid gametes. Now, I used the word haploid and diploid. You and I were diploid. Di means two. Ploidy has to do with your chromosome number. So if you are diploid, you have two copies of your chromosomes. All right, so we got 23 pairs. If you're haploid, you have one copy of the chromosome. That would be haploid, and we make our gametes. So meiosis probably got started as some change in the way that we do mitosis, and I'm not going to get into that from here. But stay tuned for my next episode when we talk about meiosis and the generation of haploid gametes for sexual reproduction. Well, this has been another episode of Tom Kennedy Science. Until next time.